uh, brother Bovaird and uh, his family. Uh, his mother had a stroke this morning, and so let's be remembering them in prayer, if you would, please. Let's turn to Luke chapter 15 this morning. Luke chapter 15. And I would like to begin, uh, read, well, I'd like to read uh, verse, beginning in verse 11. You could follow with me in your Bible, if you would, please. Luke chapter 15, verse 11. The Lord Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees and uh, the public and the scribes, and he says to them, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me, and he divided unto him his living. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he rose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, and had compassion, and ran, and fell on his neck, and kissed him. And the son said unto the father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. The father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and he began to be merry. Let's bow, please, for a word of prayer. Father, how we rejoice when we sing those old hymns of the faith. We rejoice in the truths that they carry. And Father, we rejoice in the fact that they apply to us who have trusted Christ as Savior. Father, we rejoice when we read the Word of God, the inspired, inerrant, infallible, and immutable Word of God. Thank you for this Word that can be an objective truth to us so that we can know the way. I just pray, my Father, now as we have this service, that by your Holy Spirit, You'd open the lips of your servant to speak in the heart of every person to receive with meekness the word of God. That you might reach out into those who are watching on live stream and those who are listening on the radio and speak to their hearts as well. Minister to all of us, my Father. We give you all the glory. We just ask that you might magnify yourself and glorify your Son, edify your people, save those who are lost. Well, thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. This, of course, is the famous parable that has become known as the parable of the prodigal son. The word prodigal has different meanings. Number one, it means spending money or resources freely and recklessly. It means to be wastefully extravagant. The second meaning is this, having or giving something on a lavish scale. Now, keep in mind that the word prodigal is not used in the Bible. Prodigal is a term that has been applied in an attempt to describe the actions of the younger son who left the father's house. But according to the definition of the word, there are actually two prodigals in the parable. Number one, there is the prodigal son who spent his inheritance in riotous living wastefully and recklessly. But then there is the prodigal father who gave a homecoming for his son on a lavish scale. The prodigal son spent all his resources on himself, but the prodigal father spent lavishly on someone else, his son. One was selfish and the other was selfless. One was out of pride and rebellion, the other was out of love and out of joy. Though this parable is called the parable of the prodigal son and comments and attention are usually placed predominantly on the son, it is 
more a parable about the Father, I think, than anything else. It is the character and the compassion and the concern of the Father that shines out through this parable like a veritable beacon of hope to everyone that reads it. It is the unconditional love and unquestionable forgiveness and the unfathomable grace of the Father that's on display here. And with this in mind, I want to look at a few things this morning. The first thing I want to look at is, number one, a good son goes bad. A good son goes bad. Now, some commentators have said that this parable is about a lost sinner getting saved. I understand where they're going, and I understand how they make that application. But I want to make application today to a wayward son coming home. The younger son that leaves the father's house, I believe, is a picture of an erring and rebellious son of the heavenly father that needs restitution. Now, how do we know that the parable can be applicable to a son of a father, to a child of God? Well, he is called a son in verse 11, verse 13, verse 21, verse 24, and verse 30. That's a good indication. Amen? The father is called his father in verse 12 and verse 20. The son is called, he actually calls the father my father, in verse 27 and verse 32. And in reference to the elder son, he is called thy brother, in verse 27 and in verse 32. So it seems to me, if we read those words in their context, and we take them by their common meaning, it shows us that there's a a family relationship going on here. There is the father, and there are the two sons, and they are brothers one to another. And so we have this family situation. Next, he is given his inheritance as a rightful son and an heir in verse 12. Here's what happened. The elder son, that would be the firstborn, would receive what the Bible instructs to be a double portion. In other words, this young son, who was the secondborn, he was only uh, entitled to one-third of the inheritance, while his brother would be entitled to two-thirds of the inheritance. And so this younger son said to his father, I'd like to have my inheritance now. I'd like to have my one-third now. Now, this is a son who's been with the father for quite a while. He's old enough now to go on his own. He's old enough now, he thinks, to take care of himself. And he decides, you know, I've been a good son all these, all these years. I'd like to have my inheritance. I'd like to strike out on my own. I believe that since a lost sinner cannot call God father and that no lost sinner can claim any inheritance among the children of God, and since no lost sinner is part of the household of God, and since no lost sinner is called brother by the born-again ones, and since no lost sinner is ever called by the Father a son, in conclusion of those facts, we could say that this is indeed a parable of a wayward son who has left the house of the Father and has struck it out on his own. But then there's somebody who will say, what about what the Father says in verse 24 and verse 32? So let's go there and look at that. The Father, on receiving his son back, says this, For this my son was what? Dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be married. So some people look at those two words, they see dead, and they see lost, and they say, well, it must be referring to a sinner who's lost and on his way to hell. Well, if you took the time to look the Greek words up for the words dead and the words lost, you'll find that the dictionary says that they can be used either literally or figuratively. And I propose that the Father in this passage is using them figuratively. Why? Because the Son was never literally dead And the son was never literally lost. 
The son always knew where he was, and he always knew where his father was, and he always knew how to get from where he was to where his father was, so he wasn't really literally lost, but he was figuratively lost. The father had lost him to the world. And he was dead to the father. The father, listen, had no communication with the son. And he had no fellowship with his son. He couldn't see his son. He couldn't touch his son. He couldn't talk to his son. You see, they didn't have all the modern communication devices that we have today. He couldn't Skype his son. He couldn't text his son. He couldn't call his son. His son's in a far country. That means his son's far away. And in those days, when someone was far away, they were gone. They, he might as well have been dead because he couldn't be with the father, couldn't help the father. And so when the father says, this was my son who for all practical purposes and figuratively was dead, he's alive again. This my son who I lost to the world, he's back again. I found him again. He was a good son, gone bad. It happens. Christians can get all starry-eyed toward the world and all the dainties and goodies that it dangles before their eyes. The world is full of empty promises, which it makes, but it cannot keep. The world doesn't mind lying to you because it's the world. Many a Christian has felt that the rules and restrictions of a loving father are onerous and has set out to free himself from the loving restraints and kind wisdom of their father who only wants to do what's best for them and then they become entangled in the world's wicked web of deceit and destruction. I know how it is as a young man. I should say when I was a young man. You know, I always wanted to get out of the house. My dad was cramping my style. I mean, I wanted to get out of there. I wanted to, at that time, I wanted to grow my hair long. That was rebellion in those days. It still is, by the way. The Bible says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. And so I wanted to get out from underneath my father's thumb and out of his rules. And I didn't like his restrictions and I thought he was old and he didn't know nothing. I know how it is. Just because a person gets saved doesn't mean they still don't have some of those natural desires that go on. Many a Christian has wanted to get away from the rules and regulations, but I want to tell you something, friends, you never get away from rules and regulations. I don't care where you go, I don't care what you do, you're going to be under rules regulations, restrictions. You say, not me, I'm going to live the way I want, I'm going to do what I want to do, I'm going to say what I want to say. Yeah, you'll go to jail and then you'll be really under rules and regulations. Amen? I mean, this world tells you how fast you can drive. Amen? It tells you how much taxes you have to pay. I mean, there's all kinds of restrictions out there. This young man had everything going for him there in the father's house. But he could not see it or appreciate it until he lost it. Isn't that interesting? We talked about that a little bit in Sunday school. We take so many things for granted until we lose it. And young people take sometimes their homes and their parents and, and the provision so for granted. Until they have to go out on their own, they go, man, I didn't know it was going to be this hard out here. <coughs> kind of like President Trump. You know what he just said? He said, I didn't know it was going to be this hard being president. <laughs> <laughs> he had everything. And he didn't appreciate it. Until he lost it. The dangers and temptations of the world overwhelmed him. And the Bible says he wasted his substance 
with riotous living in the far country. I'm sure when he got that third of that inheritance, he felt like he was the king. He felt like he was a millionaire. I mean, his pockets were full, and he was just full of himself. Amen? And he's going to go down to the far country, and he's going he's to show what's going on down there. Went through his hands like that. But the Bible says riotous living. It is the Greek word azotos. It means desolute. It means lacking moral restraint, uninhibited, uncontrolled. It means fast. So he wanted to get in the fast lane. He wanted to go down and live the fast lifestyle. And he lost everything. He was a good son. Gone bad. You know, the world is far away from the Father, even if it's only a step away. You hear what I said? The world is far away from the Father, even if it's only a step away. You know, sometimes we go down and we visit the far country. Sometimes we go down and we linger in the far country. Sometimes we go down and we stay in the far country but it's still away from the Father, isn't it? You know, there are many Christians, good sons, who go bad for a period of time. But I want to go to point number two. My point, second point is this, gone but not forgotten. We know that he was gone from the Father's house. We don't know how long. But we know it was long enough to lose everything that he had. He was gone from the Father's house but he was not gone from the Father's heart. He was gone from the Father's life, but he was not forgotten by the Father. Look at verse 20. This says, The Son, and he rose and came to his Father, but when he was yet, what? A great way off, his Father saw him. No matter how wayward, No matter how negligent a child becomes, they are never forgotten by those who have poured their heart and lives in providing for them, protecting them, and loving them. And that's why the moms and dads of convicted felons and murderers can weep at their execution. They're gone, but they're not forgotten. You know, it's a great heartbreak when that son or daughter whom came into the world so helpless and so vulnerable, who depended on you for everything, who depended on you literally for life itself, turns and walks away. That's heartbreaking, isn't it? The child whom the parent had only its best interests in mind begins to find fault and falsely accuse of not caring and not loving. I think probably the most harsh words a child can say to their parent is, you don't love me, or I don't love you. Because that parent has to be a parent. And being a parent means you have to say no, and you have to discipline, you have to put rules, you have to put restrictions, you have to teach, you have to admonish, you have to need to correct. There's a lot of stuff that goes into being a father or a mother that children don't understand and they don't like. And sometimes in their foolishness and in their immaturity and in their, their sinfulness, they say, you don't love me. And that goes like a knife into a parent's heart. Amen? Or I want to leave. I'm sick and tired of you. I'm tired of this place. I'm out of here. Wow. I've just tried to do everything I could for you. I've been trying. That don't count. It happens. But that child is never forgotten but is ever on the heart and mind of the loving parent. Amen? Look at the father in verse 20. It says, he sees his son a great way off. So what does that tell us? The idea here is that the father, who represents God in the story, 
was vigilantly looking. He was peering into the distance, looking for the slightest visage of his returning son. Now, he saw him a great way off. That means he, it, it seems to me it, that it, it's indicating to us that he went out there every day and looked down that road as far as he could. Maybe he's coming home today. He never forgot that son. I'm sure, there, I'm sure the son had forgotten him for a while. When he was dining with all his friends and all his pals and they were involved in riotous living and they were living it up and having a great time and didn't know what day it was or what time it was and didn't care, I'm sure he didn't, wasn't thinking about the father. But every morning that father got up and thought about his son. And every night that father went to bed and prayed for his son Amen. and went over and over again because he was gone, but he wasn't forgotten. While the son wasted his substance, the father was waiting. While the son defiled himself in riotous living, the father was diligently looking. And while the son was living in rebellion to all that the father stood for, the father was standing with faithfulness and expectation for the return of his son. Dear child of God, you may, you may be gone, but you're not forgotten. You may be unlovely, but you're not unloved. You may be disappointing, but you are not despised. And you may be rebellious, but you have never been rejected by the Heavenly Father. You say, well, I'm in church. You can't be talking to me. Yeah, I'm talking to you. This is only, this is only an hour out of the week. <laughs> There's a whole week out there, amen? Amen. And sometimes during that week, we take a little visit down to the far country. Sometimes we visit the far country and we linger for a little while. And the empty seats may be those who went down to the far country for a visit, but ended up staying. Out of the will of the Father. But they're not forgotten. And they're not unloved. Even though the son was not in the father's house, he was in the father's heart. That's unconditional love. And you know, I really don't think children can understand unconditional love until they have a child. Oh, I can't tell you how many times I've heard parents tell me that their child never understood them until they had their own children. Then all of a sudden it's like, whoa, was I like this? <laughs> yep. Did I cause that much trouble and mess? Yep. I didn't say things, yep. So point number one is a good, a good son gone bad. Point number two is gone but not forgotten. I like not point number three. And it gives me a goosebump. My third point is God runs. You know, it's sad how we get to such strange ideas about God. Like, how about, the, how about the idea of God with a club? How many people live their whole lives under this image of God in heaven with a great big club, and he's just waiting for you to step out of line so he can whack you with that club? Boy, that's a terrible way to live your life. That's not the God of the Bible. Or how about, how about the God will get you for that kind of thing? <laughs> you know? Well, God will get you for that. Like, God's just waiting to get you. If I read my New Testament, I see God waiting to bless you. This father was waiting to receive and to forgive. He wasn't waiting as soon as that son came around the corner and said, It's about time you get home, boy! Boom! <laughs> we think God's like that. He isn't. We so often try to make God in our own image. But you see, we're sinful and flawed and marred. He is not. We are limited to our own short-sightedness and our own selfishness, but He is not. And we're quick to anger, but the Bible says He's slow to anger. And what I want to see most clearly today is that the Father, listen to this, He ran to meet His Son. He ran to meet the returning Son. 
Since the Father in this parable represents God the Father, we see for the only instance in Scripture that I can find a reference to God running. That just makes me want to go, Woo! God, I, I can't find him anywhere else in the Bible running. But I find him running here. He runs to meet the returning son. We do not find the father sitting on the porch waiting for his wayward son to grovel at his feet. We do not find the father gloating over the humiliation of his rebellious son or saying, I told you so. We do not find the father reluctantly shuffling toward the disappointing son, expecting a long and drawn out petition for mercy to which he may or may not grant clemency. No, we find a loving, caring, and forgiving father running to the son he missed so much and was willing to eagerly forgive and restore. That's what we see here. God running to his son. God running to restore. God running to embrace him and forgive him. Notice how the father greeted the repentant son. Not with, well, it's about time, but with compassion, the Bible says. This word compassion, it simply means sympathy, pity, and bowels of yearning. Because the father knew that the son of his love was returning in filthy rags. He knew that his son was returning from self-righteousness. His son had wallowed in the filth of the pig pen and starved spiritually there and returning malnutritioned and contrite and still with the smell of the pig pen on him. And yet he embraced him with compassion. The Bible says he fell on his neck. That phrase simply means he hugged him close to himself. With all his filth and all his stench, his father grabbed him and hugged him to himself. It means he fell on his neck. He put his hand on the back of the neck of that son and put his forehead to his forehead and his face to his face and hugged him to himself. And it says he kissed him. I mean, he slobbered all over this boy. I mean, he kissed him all over the face. And I believe he said, son, I love you, I love you, I love you. I ran when I saw you coming. I couldn't wait to hold you again. I couldn't wait to see you again. I couldn't wait to take you again. When I read verse 20, I see God the Father running. I see my Father, my Heavenly Father running to me when I need Him. The most. To meet his errant child who has come to themselves and returned. I see the love of my heavenly father for me. And I see that every second that I may be away and out of his will. That I am always his son and never forgotten. And he will run to meet me when I return. Now, my friends, I don't, that doesn't mean I say to myself, well, I think I'll go down the pig pen and check it out. Doesn't mean I think I'll run down the far country and see what's happening. Doesn't mean I'm going to take advantage, but it sure gives me a great confidence and a great hope and a great comfort that if at any time I ever find myself in such a situation, I can always go home. Amen? Amen. I don't want to disappoint my father. I don't want to embarrass my father. I want to honor him and glorify him. But I'm a human being and you're a human being. And the Bible says that ye that think you stand, take heed lest ye fall. Any one of us in this room this morning could end up in the pig pen. Not because we want to or, or, or set out to. He didn't set out to be in a pig pen. But any one of us could find ourselves there. And isn't it a wonderful thing to know? And when we turn around, here comes running the Father. Here comes God running to me. Because he loves me so much. And he misses me while I'm down there. 
David knew this truth. In Psalm 32, verse 5, he wrote this, I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Selah. You know what? I read a commentary. That, that word Selah means, what do you think about that? The prodigal son, he knew it. Here's what he said. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. You see the repentant heart? You see the humble attitude? Did you notice? He was able to say this to the father. I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. But he never got the words out. Make me as one of thy hired servants. The father wouldn't let him say those words. The father cut him short. And looked over to a servant and said, get the robe, get the ring, get that calf. I want shoes for my son's feet. I want a ring for his hand. I want a robe. Look at these filthy rags. Cover him up. No son of mine's going to look like that. And put shoes on his feet. I won't take him home and bare feet. Put some shoes on him. Put a ring so he know, everybody knows he's my son. The father restored his son to the position he had before he left. He didn't drag him before the rest of the household and say, hey, look at this. This is what happens to you when you don't listen to me. This is what happens when you leave. This is what happens. Mark my words. Look at him now. Uh -uh. He covered him up in a robe, put shoes on his feet and a ring on his hand. And he said, now you go get that calf that we've been saving for a special event because my son's back home and we're going to have ourselves a time. We're going to make merry tonight. My son's back. That just kind of speaks to my heart when I think about my Heavenly Father. I don't want to sell Him short. I, listen, I deserve all that. The prodigal son deserved all that. But aren't you glad you don't get what you deserve? Aren't you glad for the grace and mercy of our Heavenly Father because of Jesus Christ? Reminds me of 1 John 1, 9. It says, if we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Dear Christian brother or sister, I do not know where you have been or what you have done. But I know this, even the world's pig pen's filth and stink cannot separate you from the love of the Father. Even the fact that you may have squandered your substance which He has provided for you or wasted a ministry or a spiritual gift or turned your back on Him, your Father, the God of heaven, will run with compassion and hug you back in and earnestly kiss you with joy and forgiveness the moment you turn your face toward Him. And what if you're here this morning or watching or listening and you've never been part of the household of faith? You've never been made a child of God. Listen, you can't always have been a child of God. The Bi Were you always a human child? Were you always the child? I mean, you were born at one time, weren't you? You, didn't, you know, you weren't like eternal. You were born into your family. You were born to your parents. You know what? You want to be born... To God, you have to be born again. Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. If you haven't been born again, you're not a child of God. Jesus said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. You're just flesh. You've been born of fleshly parents on a fleshly planet for a fleshly life. You're a sinner. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You want to be part of God's family. You want to be a child of God. You have to be born of God. You have to be born again. That which is, he said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. The Bible says God is a spirit. If you want to be born of God, you have to be born of the Spirit. And the Bible says, but as many as received Him, that's the Lord Jesus, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name, which are born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. How do you receive Christ? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see, salvation is a free gift of God. He takes you into His family by His mercy and by His grace. There's nothing you can do to deserve. You didn't do anything to deserve being born. You, you didn't earn being born. You didn't get, you know, you didn't get uh, points that you could redeem to be born. It was by the grace of God that you were born. 
It's by the grace of God you get born again, spiritually in his family. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God says in 2 Peter 3, 9, that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know what? God wants you to be part of his family. He wants you to be a son. And once a son, always a son. And when you fall, he'll be there to pick you back up. And when you stray, he'll be there to welcome you back. God wants you to be part of his family. That's why Jesus came. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. What a father in this story. Willing to forgive and restore the repentant son who came home. Maybe you're here this morning, maybe you're watching or listening and you're a born-again Christian. You know you're a child of God. Raise your hand if you're here. If you're sitting here, just raise it. Just say, yes, I, I'm not ashamed of it. Went to angels in heaven to know I'm a child of God. Thank you. You can put them down. Then let me ask you this. Are you where God wants you to be, doing what God wants you to do? Or have you found his rules and restrictions onerous? Have you, are you down in a far country just for a visit? Are you lingering? Maybe this morning there's a Christian in this room that needs to come and say, Father, forgive me. I've been down in the pig pen. If it's been a day, it's too long. Maybe there's some Christians in this room that say, I just want to come and say thank you, Father, for the wonderful comfort and confidence that this parable gives to me. I don't ever want to go down the pig pen. I don't ever want to get out of your will. But oh, I'm so glad to know you love me enough to receive me back. Maybe you're here today and you've never been born again. And you, you say, I'd like to be born again. I need to be born again. I want to have Christ as my Savior and God as my Father. Well, my friend, you can receive Christ as your Savior right where you sit in the privacy of your own heart and mind. It's not something you do. It's something you receive. You receive the free gift of eternal life by receiving Christ as your Savior. Maybe you'd like to pray right there where you sit. I'll help you with it if you want me to. And you'd like to confess your sin to God and trust Christ as your Savior. And if you'd like to do so, I want you to look up at me and, and I'll know that you want to pray and trust Christ your Savior because I'll see you face to face. And you just keep looking at me until I see you and our eyeballs meet and I'll know that that's your desire. We'll pray together. You can become a child of God right where you sit. You say, is it that easy? No, it was hard. God had to sacrifice Jesus Christ, the only begotten. And Jesus Christ had to bear your sins in his own body on the tree and die in your place, be buried in your tomb. No, it wasn't easy for God, but it's easy for you. It's free to you, but it cost God. That's why it's a gift. You say, I want that gift. Anybody like that here today? I want that gift, and I'm ready to take that gift right now. Father, I thank you for the salvation we have in Christ. I thank you for the relationship we have with you as father and son. I thank you, Father, for the brothers and sisters in Christ. I thank you for the forgiveness we have and for the wonderful promise that you said you'd never leave us and you'd never forsake us. We're never forgotten. I pray, Heavenly Father, you'd help us today as Christians to come and, and adore you and praise you and thank you and, and just come before your presence and and, and be honest with you that we don't ever want to fail you, but when we do, we're thankful. Maybe there's some here that are down in the pig pen and need to get out, get home. Maybe they'll come. I don't know why they're here, but you do, Father. Just bring folks forward that they might honor and glorify you. 
And if there's anybody in this room that needs to be saved, I pray you'd help them to have the concern for their eternal soul to come and meet me at the front so we can help them. We ask your blessing on the invitation. We love you, praise you, and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together, please. We're going to sing our closing hymn, number 161. Must Jesus bear the cross alone? Why don't you come? Why don't you spend a moment with the Lord? And maybe you'd just like to say thank you, Lord, for being such a wonderful father. Maybe sometimes we get the wrong idea and we need to come and say, I'm sorry, Lord, I should never think that about you. Maybe you, you just need to come and say, I've got a little bit of the pig pen on me. I need to get it cleaned off. Why don't you come? We're going to sing that first stanza. If you need to be saved, you come and see me, all right, as we sing. Must Jesus bear the cross alone And all the world go free I can't think of many more precious pictures than a heavenly father who will run to a returning child. That's an awesome picture. Thank God who, for who he is and what he's like. Amen? Mike, would you close us in prayer, please? Lord, thank you for the position that you've given us as your sons, Lord, and I thank you for allowing us to become your children, and Lord, uh, if there's anyone here that still doesn't know you as their Savior, Lord, please just uh, um, help them uh, not to be able to feel comfortable, Lord, until, they, uh, until they've accepted you as their Savior there and uh, um, acknowledge that need, Lord. And uh, Lord, thank you, that, uh, thank you that when we do go away from you, Lord, that you're waiting to run back to us, Lord, not to... Um, not to uh, fall on us harshly, Lord, but to fall on us lovingly. And Lord, please just um, help us as your sons not to walk away, Lord, and help us to stay close to you where you want us to be, Lord, and help us to um, walk close to you daily. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, let's close with one verse of 660.